Welcome to this week's episode of the Scottish Property Podcast. My name is Nick Ponte and I'm joined as always with Stephen Clark. Hi Nick, how are you doing? Not bad mate, what's been happening this week? So this week we have got an interview with Craig Gallagher from Quinergy um, and basically they're going to discuss property compliance for renting out your property which I know might come across as a boring subject but it's very very important and so crucial I think as well isn't it? Well, you'll definitely agree with me as a letting agent. I think that with the fast pace that this sort of changes, uh, at, you need to really be up to speed with it. And okay, you can uh, get a letting agent to deal with all this for you. But ultimately, what, what I found really interesting when I actually became a letting agent, I actually learned that um, if something happens in the property and you've missed something, uh, then it actually falls back on you as the landlord, not the letting agent, if the shit hits the fan. Yes. So, you know, it's so important to know all this stuff yeah, and, and all, your responsibilities. Yeah, although you, you you can trust your letting agent to do it, and, and as a professional, they should be doing that, obviously. But if mistakes happen, then ultimately it's you as the property owner and the landlord that, that bears the responsibility. So, absolutely 100% crucial. Uh, Craig Gallagher from uh, Quinergy, uh, obviously, they do all the compliance, and he brought us up to speed with absolutely everything that you need. Um, and obviously gave us time scales, how often you need to do them, and the cost as well, which I think will be interesting for people. Uh, so hope you enjoy it, guys, and hope you find it useful. And uh, we'll cut to the interview with Craig. So Craig Gallagher from Quinergy, thanks very much for joining us on the Scottish Property Podcast. How are you? I'm good, thank you for having us on. Now, you just... Yeah, uh, good, thanks very much. Uh, Stephen Clark's here as well on the line. Stephen? How are you doing, Craig? Good to see you, mate. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you, Stephen. So, Craig, you've just uh, read out your schedule for today. You're through in Edinburgh today, and I think you've got about 12 different appointments on. So we're going to just rip through this as quick as possible. But we thought it would be really useful for the listeners because today we're going to be talking about landlord compliance. And it's something that is really crucial. Uh, when you get your rental properties up and running, you need to make sure that you're compliant as a landlord. So Craig specializes in this sort of thing. Craig at Quinergy, um, he runs Quinergy and basically they're a company that carry out all the certification, all the landlord compliance. So Craig, we're just going to start off. Um, let's just start off with the, the EICR then. What's, what's EICR? Right, okay, so an EICR, it basically it stands for an electrical uh, condition, uh, installation condition report. So uh, quickly, it's it's basically an MOT for your car, but for your electrics for your house. So it's a kind of a report, 50% um, built up with visual inspections and 50% on testing. Um, and this just gives you a kind of overview of the electrics of your property. So it, it'll tell you... Um, when it was wired, what regulation it was wired to, if, if it's um, to correct standards. Um, and then th this will give you a kind of um, an idea of what's required to make the property safe or bring up to a standard that then somebody else can rent it off you. Um, so when, when you carry out any ICR, you're looking from the very start of the electrical installation. So when the, the main cable comes in from Scottish Power, you're looking at that setup. The, from then after that, you're making sure that the bonding, the earthing is all correct, the fuse box is correct, and then all the outgoing supplies from the fuse box. So make sure the sockets are good, the light switches, all that kind of thing. And and then what we pick up from that um, would be categorised as a C1, C2, C3, C4. So any urgent, very unsafe things would be a C1, and you would have to rectify that on a day or isolate the electrics. Uh, a C2 uh, means that you can, you've can you got a four-week period to get uh, these recommendations carried out. This could be like earthing arrangements, bonding, IP-rated lights and bathrooms, kitchens, all that kind of thing. Um, and then you, you need to get that rectified. Uh, I mean, a work certificate either issued or a new EICR um, provided after that. And then once it's satisfactory, that's you safe to rent it out. What kind of uh, things would be would be in a C1, Craig? Um, so a C1 would be like immediate risk. So something you could uh, very easily touch and get an electric shock or something that's severely uh, damaged by heat. So it could be like a fuse inside the fuse box that's it's melted inside 
and could easily cause a fire because the fuse is not going to trip. Or just say, for instance, a smashed socket and you can see the copper behind or big holes in the fuse box. Again, just say a, a young tenant or somebody who's not too kind of clued up on electrical things, you're going to the fuse box cupboard and I'm going to pull out a pair of shoes or a jacket and it falls on the fuse box and they put their hand on it and their finger goes up into like the hole. It, it, basically, you can get an electric shock straight away. So things like that. Or if his cover's missing off the main cable head or the earth size is not correct, um, the main cables are not correct, they, they are, they're kind of C1s. How can, how can rarely, listeners look out for them when they're, they're kind of viewing a property to appraise it for their kind of costs for making it compliant? Uh, so basically, what you're, you, uh, the first thing I would go and look at is take, when you go into a property and you're looking at it, you're appraising it, look at the main cable head coming in. Um, you can tell, well, you, you kind of can tell if it's wrapped in cloth or a kind of tar substance, and you know it's a very old cable head. If it's old, then um, like black uh, plastic, you know it's a kind of old cable. So I, I would then obviously contact your uh, energy provider to find out if that needs upgraded. Then look at the fuse box. Um, again, discoloration will tell you how old it is. Um, if it's plastic, that's the old addition. So that's um, the addition before we're in just now. So that, that's actually classed as a non-fire rated consumer unit. But um, because it was wired in the 17th edition, it doesn't need um, change just now. But we always recommend that you always change it to a metal fire rated one, but it's not a requirement. I was so, going to say that. Uh, I've had to do quite a few changes of fuse boxes and that. And uh, is it right with the, uh, they've got to be metal, haven't they? The plastic ones are no good, are they? Uh, so nowadays, any, any work that you do to your property, you've got to bring the full installation up to that standard. So you right. can't leave it. So... If you're just doing an EICR and everything else is fine, then the plastic consumer unit will pass. Right. Um, there, is, there is nothing wrong with it. Um, it's just an event of fire. It doesn't hold in. Uh, it's not got the best fire rating, so it can, the fire can yeah. spread through the fuse box. And if anybody wants to go and see any examples of these things, then go on to Craig's Instagram, Quinnergy on, on Instagram. Is, is it Quinnergy on the Instagram, Craig? Eh? I, I think I think actually it's Quinnergy Limited, but I think we've tried to shorten it down to Quinnergy. Right. Um, we've not been on it the last couple of days. We've been really, really busy, but we've got some good content coming up soon. I, um, I like I like seeing all the kind of like, obviously you've got a lot of properties and you're seeing a lot of kind of, you know, botched jobs if you like you know so i love seeing all these pictures of that i mean it's some of this frightening to be honest with you uh the, the one we're trying to do one with like extensions so when you go into kitchens people uh, seem to have a like one socket then an extension then another extension plugged in another extension then doing a washing machine or doing a dishwasher like the, we see this all the time especially right. in old, old tenements in glasgow because there's just not enough sockets yeah um yeah. So I will try to build I can, some good content on that. So I have more to come. And on the EICR, then how how often do we need to get this done as landlords? Right. So this is this is a subject that kind of everyone gets caught up on all the time. So um, an EICR is valid to up to five years. Um, the the real um, the real duration is down to the engineer that's testing on the day. So if it's a very dated and Kind of system that's deteriorating over time and you can tell it's deteriorating by its test results then the engineer might go right it's passed but we want to see it getting uh, revisited every year every six months every two years every three years so the, the, the quick question that is an EICR is valid for five years depending on the engineer's reporting but also yeah. just to touch on that some local authorities councils housing associations have different views on this and they stipulate that it might be done every two years or every three years or every change of tenancy. So you really want to check your local authorities um, first to find out what they're asking for. So I know South Lanarkshire, uh, when you go for a new land registration, you need to provide a new EICR for every new tenancy if your mm. landlord registration is running out or they want to check up on you. Right. So, our kind of, our view on it is it's best to try and get, not a full ICR done, but like a an electrical report done every change of tenancy. Okay. Everything right. Cool, cool. What one do you want to move on to next then? Gas safe? 
Aye, I think gas safety. I mean, this is the one that's been about for years. Most people kind of know about it and are more scared about this than anything else, um, and quite rightly so. But so in I, fact, I just safety... before you, before you go any further, there's a lot of landlords out there that still believe that the gas safety is the only thing you really need. Do you know what I mean? Know. Which, is, which is why it's so important to get you on today because it's an ever changing, fast paced moving uh, cog which keeps going round and, and more stuff keeps coming out and changes so it's important to keep on top of it. As, uh, we, we've come across a few landlords that like they just ask us to do their gas safeties and then say have you got your electrical certificate have you, have you got your legionella and they're like I've never ever done anything like that. <laughs> never, heard, never heard of that what are you talking about? Oh, right? I <laughs> so I, I get a gas safety is basically the same it's an MOT for your gas insulation it basically tells you if the gas pipe coming into the property um, going to the meter is safe, then leaving the meter going to your gas hob, your gas boiler, or your gas fire. It's basically just checking that the gas supply is, is sound. Um, it's not it's not checking the operation of the installation. So it's not telling you if the boiler's working uh, efficiently or if it's everything in the boiler's working correctly or the gas fire. It's literally telling you if the gas installation is safe to use. Um, and a, a lot of people after a gas safety say, oh, the boiler's not worked after you've done a gas safety. But this is just, obviously we need to switch the boiler off, do checks and stuff like that, but we put it back on. Things can happen to the boiler after the gas safety, but it really, we're not looking at the operation of the boiler. Yeah. So a, a, a gas safety is every year. Um, I don't know anywhere else that requires a gas safety more or more frequent than every year. I've not came across anything like that yet. So uh, it is every year. And by law, even through COVID just now, you can't let your dates lapse. So what I don't know why I've done this, it doesn't really make much sense, but you can now go forward two months. So you mm -hmm. can do a gas safety in 10 months rather than a year. Don't know the advantages or benefits of that um, through what we're going through because... You still need. To, you would still get it done after every twelve months. So think, Craig, what's what's the cost of a gas safety? I probably should have asked that about the EICR as well, just to give the uh, listeners a, a basic kind of indication. So an EICR, like there is companies out there that do them uh, under like seventy five pounds, um, and they can go up to like two hundred and fifty, depending on the size of the house or the property. A rule of thumb is between fifteen and twenty five pound per circuit. Right. So. Uh, if you've got 10 circuits, it should be £250, but I think if nowadays, uh, there's not many people that will charge that kind of money, and if they are, then they're only really doing one EICR and one property each day. Um, we are we are slightly different because we are um, we can scale up for this. All our guys are running with iPads. There's usually two guys doing an EICR at a time, and that's all they're doing all day. We can do a bit more than the, the average electrician that's just maybe doing one or two EICRs a week. Um, so the, I, I would say the fair price just now for any ICR is around about uh, 85 to 150, mm -hmm. um, give or take that on top of that. A gas safety, again, if you're getting a lot of volume, you can go down to like 40. Um, but I think the average man in a van is about 60 pounds, something like that, 60, 65 pounds plus that. Yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure the listeners will find that use, useful and to understand the costs involved in them as well. Especially yeah. when you're doing appraising of uh, what you need to spend in the property. I mean, I usually say to landlords, really, your first month's rent, you know, take on average a 500 pound rent or something like that, 600 pound rent. Usually your first month's rent is taken up just with like, you know, compliance and things like that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, I do, I, I've noticed that that is probably perfect. Like the first month's rent is usually on compliance and like setup fees, yeah. getting the tenant signed in, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we're seeing now a, a, lot of, a lot of landlords, a lot of investors now are doing the compliance at the start of the refer or maybe getting, getting us in to do the compliance to then work out what's involved in a refurb. Yeah. Um, we are, the last couple of years, it was always refurb first and then, oh, the tenant moving in, we need this compliance. We're going out. And the, the, the flat is immaculate. It's all been really nice done and it needs smoke alarms. There's remedials from the EICR. There might be some remedials from the gas safety. And then mm. you're having to strip out all the good work that's been done um, to try and get cables in for smoke alarms. Lucky enough now we can use battery operated, but mm. I do think the compliance should be 
near enough at the start. Um, could that, you, you never know, you might need a rewire or the boiler could be condemned or the gas pipe's not the right size, it's coming into the property. Yeah. So yeah. That, that obviously affects, if you've got £10,000 to do a refurb, there could be three or £4,000 and bringing us up to standard. So it's yeah. maybe good to get the compliance done at the start. You mentioned alarms there. Let's just talk quickly about uh, alarms then. So what do we yeah. need in terms of smoke um, alarms? So the rule has not changed for rental properties since 2015. Um, so you need a, you basically need a, a smoke alarm in every uh, kind of living space. So either the, the living room or if the dining room is more frequent used or a TV room, then it's got to be in there. It's got to be in every hallway and every landing and then a heat detector in the kitchen. Um, and all these alarms need to be interlinked. And they can either be interlinked through cabling or through RF. Um, and RF seems to be the way forward just now. Sorry, what's RF, just so that people know? No, RF is radio frequency, so it's it's basically the, the, the base of the alarm. When it sounds, it activates a signal uh, which sends it to another base. That picks it up and sets off the other alarm, then sends it to the next alarm and, and so forth. This is a good point when you were talking about there, Craig, about your, um, doing the compliance at the start during the renovation because... Hardware smoke alarms are so much cheaper than, than RF bases, aren't they? Oh, the, a massive difference. Mm -hmm. um, and the and if you had a property that you were doing and then you have to retrofit, the RF would make so much sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's a couple of types of RF. So you can get RF, which that need a power supply as well. So you just need to actually give them a power supply. So you could come off a light fitting that as long as it's got a permanent feed at it or a socket as long as you you spur down and then you put an RF base in, you power that up and then you put a normal uh, wired smoke alarm on top of it. So the slight savings there, but then there's more labour involved. When you actually go for a full battery operated smoke alarm, they are very expensive, but there is no, there's not as much labour um, and there's obviously no decorational issues. The, um, Sorry, probably important to note there with the battery operated, full battery operated, they need to be ten like uh, lithium sealed, don't they? Uh, they, need to, they need to be tamper proof, uh, tamper proof lithium uh, battery, so it's a sealed unit. You can actually get the lithium battery out and put another one in if, if um, it fails in manufacture, but you've got to be approved to do that. And you've actually, this is the other thing that trips a lot of people up, is even though you're fitting battery smoke alarms, they still need to be signed off by an approved contractor to do that. And the reasons for that is so the smoke alarms are positioned correctly in the, in the room, that they're a certain distance away from walls, from ceilings, eh, from coving, or from doors opening or from windows. Or if it's in a kitchen, it's got to be a certain distance away from the kitchen units. Um, so all these take into consideration. There's a, there's a dead space, see, between when the wall meets the ceiling, if you go 300 mil out from the ceiling and 300 mil down from the wall, that triangle space all the way around the room is called a dead space. No smoke. Oh. It takes it takes hours for smoke to build up into that that area. So if you had an alarm in that position, it's never ever going to pick up the fire. You'd be dead before, or yeah. you would if the room would be filled with smoke before the alarm went off. So that these are why handymen and uh, kitchen fitters shouldn't be doing it for you. Um, yeah. It's a really good point, mate. It really shows the importance of fitting them, doing them right and getting them fitted by the right people. Yeah, definitely. And also, the other thing is, is um, I, I, I do know, I, I'm only talking about South Lanarkshire because I've just had to do my landlord registration, but they asked for a certificate for the alarms that were fitted um, and they wouldn't accept an invoice. So it had to be an actual certificate. So that's another thing with getting an approved contractor to install them is they should provide you with a certificate to say they've been installed correctly and how often they should be checked. And we, we put on our certificates that they should be checked every year. I think these, these were hardwired um, and, and it was meant to be hardwired and battery backup. And it just recently changed, didn't it? Um, no, so that, this is a wee bit of confusion. So it's changing for homeowners. So they were going to bring us out for this year, um, but that, they've changed it now to uh, February next year, I think it is. Um, that homeowners are going to be the same as rentals. Um, that they all they're all going to be you're all going to have the same amount of smoke alarms in each area, and they need to be interlinked. The the battery backup has always been has always been there since 2005, but the battery backup was just a nine volt battery. Mm -hmm. um, 
and now they're trying to change that so that even the battery backup is lithium as well, um, which monopolises the market with manufacturers in. Um, so it's, it's something that uh, it's, uh, it's something that really scares the shit out of me about being a landlord. Whenever you see a fire or something on the news, you know, and like people die in that, and then you like, you know, I, I mean, I'm quite good with doing the checks and keeping dates logged and all that for certificates, yeah. but you know, I'm always like, oh my god, straight on to the system that I've got, and I'm making sure everything's in in order. Do you know what I mean? Because it's just obviously it can be fatal, you know. It is frightening, and to be honest, we've we've been in a lot of property. We've, I've actually been involved in one that was in um, just just before Shawlands. It was quite a bad fire, uh, and we were actually we looked after a property that was above the one that went on fire, and it was actually our property's alarms that went off. Um, right. The smoke went up through the close and then through the front door, and it went to the first hallway detector, right. and it actually set it off. And that's what alerted basically everybody else on the block. The flat that was on fire was empty. Um, I don't know if squatters had come in, but basically a fire had been set inside the door. Uh, and lucky enough, one of the flats in that block had fire detection on it. So that just shows you, actually, that's happened twice. There was one where there was a fire set in a close, um, and we were looking after the ground floor flat, and same again, the alarms went off, and it alerted everybody else. But you go into people's properties, and um, I don't know the best way to put this, but some people could be hoarding a lot of stuff on their property and that's a fire risk as well and just say mm-hmm. your your rental property that you rent out is the one next door to that you want to protect your property in case one of their properties go on fire as well to minimize the risk to your own property and your tenants um yeah. so fire detection i think or smoke detection is is vital and i think we know that from all the kind of disasters we're seeing yeah. just now um, and it's always good when you get a certificate it will then give you your expiry dates or when you need them changed and how often you should be maintaining them because again some detectors need maintained they need cleaned every six months every 12 months um, you need to test them every year so yeah it's that's what the certificate's good for because it'll explain what you need to do with your detectors yeah, yeah. and with the uh, lastly on the detectors with the carbon monoxide uh, detectors obviously uh, give us a little bit about them. They 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 don't need to be. Do they they, they need to be linked, don't they? Now they need. No, they don't. They, they don't, don't need, need to be linked to, link to the yeah. smoke alarms. Um, so you, good practice is you can. Cause that means when the, the CO detector is going off and you're you're in the living room or something, you can you, you can tell the alarms are going off. But it, it's a 50 50 one on that. But basically, a CO detector in Scotland, you need one where your boiler is. And again, there's regulations and rules on where it should be placed, um, certain distance away from the window, certain distance away from cupboards. Um, mm. It can't be in the cupboard. If the boiler's inside a the cupboard, then the steel detector has to be outside the cupboard. Um, also, if the flu, when the flu is passing through any rooms or any hallways, there has to be a seal detector in each of those rooms as well. Um, and there has to be access hatches to, to visually check the flu as well going through these rooms. So the CO detector comes under your gas safety report. It, it doesn't come under anything else. And okay. our we've changed our gas safety. So there's a wee comment on it about the CO detector and when they expire and if it's approved and been tested and stuff like that. Cool. All right. Um, EPC. EPC, it's, it's not really like a safety compliance, but um, this is more... Okay. To, to uh, obviously EPC stands for uh, Energy Performance Certificate, so it's it's telling um, the general public the energy performance of your building or your property. I.e., it's taking into account the windows, the doors, insulation, the size of the property, how it's heated up, how the hot water's heated up. Um, that's about it. Again, there you, you, you I think. For February or March this year, you need to buy a, a, a rating of a D before you can rent the property out. Yeah. And then by 2023 or 2024, uh, it needs to be at a C level um, for yeah. it to be rented out. So I think maybe safeguarding yourself now for those mm-hmm. changes could be the way forward. And simple changes or simple things you could be looking at is how is your hot water controlled? Is it 
digital thermostatic? Has it got timers on it saying you're heating? How good your insulation? Checking all your windows, all that kind of thing. So you should be say, like, if you know your properties are needing work, I would maybe start doing it now before you get to that position. Or um, people are starting to offload properties that have got like electric heating and not double glazing. Just now knowing that their type of properties could be kind of dropping in value or needing a bit more work done to them. So I, I guess there's, there's a good point and a bad point. Like there could be some cheap properties for landlords to snap up in a few years' time, or you need to spend a bit of money now on things that you've never really spent money on. Yeah, interesting. I've got one that's sitting on an F at the moment, and uh, it's something that's it's one that I manage for a landlord. So I'm going to need to think about how we can get that up. It's electric heating, and it's, um, it's single-glazed windows. So I'm thinking maybe, uh, yeah. We're seeing a lot of them. So effectively, your EPC lasts you 10 years. Mm. Um, so uh, again, for things like that, I would be changing the storage heaters for the new Lot 20 Eco heaters. I've got digital yeah. controls on them. I would put a, a digital programmer in for the hot water. Mm -hmm. The two things would bring your level down or bring it up, whatever way you look at it, by maybe, by maybe two. Yeah. Definitely yeah. one, but uh, two. The windows would definitely, that would bring you up one rating as well. So if you've done things like that, but then again, you've got to think of the cost of all that. Yeah. And obviously if you're buying a property um, with the home report, there is an EPC always included in the home report. Is that all right to use uh, for, you know, moving forward? From yeah, yeah. So right as I said, the EPC is valid for 10 uh, years. The yeah. only reason the EPC will change is if you do any changes to the property. So if you are putting windows in it, then I would just get a new EPC carried out anytime you've made any changes like that because it will what, bring your down. What sort of cost are we talking about for the EPC? Uh, same again, uh, volume wise it's like £45 but you can be paying up to like £60 depending on um, the size of the house and to be honest the location comes into that because um, because you're only usually going just for one EPC, if it's like miles away then some people might charge a wee bit more for it but yeah. um, round about £50 I would say if you set that aside. Plus fat because I think I'm usually about 60 or something like that so I think you're just to be Aye. clear, so, I, so all my prices are plus fat. I keep forgetting yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, because I'm thinking, man, man, these prices sound really. Obviously, I use you myself, so I know that. Aye. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, Aye, well, I get, I get, I guess we we've got different prices for for housing associations, for landlords, for private landlords. Like housing associations give us like maybe a thousand properties in a month to do. Yeah, so volume. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's all it's all like it's all on a scale. Exactly. It's not a set price. Cool. No. It's just to give people a rough idea. Um, so what else have we got left? Uh, Legionella. Yeah. Legionella and Pat. Yeah. Okay, on you go. Um, so Legionella, this is the one, this is the grey area. This is the one that nobody really wants to spend their money on. But again, <laughs> there is... There if, is I had, if I had a pound for every time a landlord said to me, that's not a le that's not a legal requirement. That's not Legionella. We don't need that one, do we? Well, it is a legal requirement. You need it to rent out the property. The grey area is how often you get it done and when, it, like, kind of the the right and wrong reasons of when you do it and how you do it. So, I tell you the advantages of a Legionella risk assessment. I, I was in three properties yesterday, right? Uh, two in Edinburgh, one in Glasgow, and they had hot water cylinders, and all of the properties. They didn't have their hot water on. They didn't. They don't use hot water. They've got an electric shower mm -hmm. and they use a dishwasher for doing their dishes, right? Because it's just a pain in the ass to have to turn on the the, the hot the, water. They, they, they put. They were students, right? They didn't want to pay to. Pay All right. Okay. Water. All right. So, they, they, you've got a tank, a, a, a tank, a cylinder, a metal tank full of water that's been lying stagnant now for a number of months, if not like maybe even a year. Um, and they've taped all the tap. Well, one of the properties is actually taped the hot water tap shut so that nobody would use it. So there's there's a really high risk of Legionella inside that tank, and nobody knows about it. You don't know about it. Your landlord doesn't know anything about it. The housing association doesn't know anything about it unless you go and do inspections or they get a Legionella risk assessment carried out, and then that will tell them that the hot water's not being switched on and there's a tank full of water. So you've got a risk of in a way because there's no circulation it's not being heating up and the tank like the, uh, the corroding away as well yeah so the, the, there is a real risk of legionella there with a property that's main fed that has a boiler and it's always in circulation there is hardly if not 
near enough no risk of Legionella. But you still have to get the yeah. Legionella risk assessment carried out. Yeah. So for every new property that you go to rent out, you need to provide a Legionella risk assessment for the new tenant. What we advise after that is we do it every two years, a minimum of two years, um, or change a tenancy or if the property is lying, lying empty for a while. Yeah. Um, I think that, with the Legionella, there's not, I think if I'm right in saying, again, there's not, it's, it's another grey area. They've not actually said it needs to be done, ev- you know, every single, not, but it's a, it's a kind of best practice sort of thing, isn't it? Be, you know best I mean? practice. I think I, I, they've put down that you need to, you need to prove that you are doing continuous maintenance. And the only way you can prove that yeah. is by providing a certificate or a maintenance plan. Uh-huh. Um, so this, that, that's what these are for. The great, the, the, what's set in stone is you need to provide a, a, a risk assessment for the new tenancy. Um, but we, on our certificates, we don't actually put an expiry date. So it's just got one date on it. Okay. Um, so uh, that is a grey area. We, we recommend if the house becomes empty for a while, you get it done again. Or mm-hmm. if there's been any work done, if there's a new kitchen or bathroom, because there could be some dead legs. Um, I... Um... I think that a lot of people get confused. They think a, a Legionella, uh, you know, check or risk assessment or whatever is like, you know, they you come with like a test tube and take a sample mm. of water and all that, and then take it away to a lab or Aye. something. It's it's a risk assessment, so it is literally a form. And um, is, but, I, we're not doing anything to check the water. We're literally just yeah. checking the temperatures, uh, making sure there's no storage for water, or if there is, that's documented and reported by a picture. Yeah. Uh, and then that means if it changes over time, you know there's, the risk has changed. But obviously, like you say, it's important because you need to cover yourself as the landlord. So, yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, one last one then, I think. Pat testing. Pat testing. Um, a bit like Legionella, like everyone kind of says that there's not a requirement or this and that, and same if it's new appliances and stuff. But basically, the way to look at it, if you provide any white goods or anything that can be plugged in, to your tenant, you need to ensure that that's safe to use. Um, so you need to provide, same again with a Legionella, you need to provide a new PAT report when somebody moves into the property or a tenant first moves in. And then again, the grey area is when you revisit to do the PAT, which we advise doing it every year. Um, a, it gives you continuous maintenance of those appliances and it lets you know how well the appliances are getting used and if they're deteriorating over time. Um, and also, we've been, we've been pulled, we've not been pulled up, but we've been to court twice now with two landlords who, uh, it was for the first year tribunal and they were getting brought in, a wee bit off t- topic here, but it was for damp and properties. Both, both cases were for damp and the solicitors that were doing the first year tribunal basically asked the landlord for all his compliance records so I asked for EICR, a PAT report, Legionella risk assessment, a smoky certificate. And the guy didn't want to get a PAT done every year. Um, so you get a PAT done basically every EICR. And the lawyers or solicitors come back and says, we don't think that was continuous um, assessment of the, the PAT report. We, we would have liked to have seen that every year or every two years. You've had four change of tenancies since that first part of the port was done. How do you know that the appliances were safe to use each time? And he actually got, he lost his case on that one thing, yeah. on the part report, even though the property was damp, it had nothing to do with the part report. So this is why it's- That's good. really interesting, mate. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, because what I, what I would say there is that basically they are demonstrating that they're not really a fit and proper landlord because they're not keeping on top of all these these things. Oh, yeah. So that, that yeah. ruling is going to go go against them. If there's anything like that, you know, it could be could be rent arrears, like you say, it could be like that, damp issues. Anything. Well, that, that's how it started. It's basically started rent arrears, and then the tenant came back and says, well, I've got damp, mm-hmm. and I've had a light that's not working, and you've never came to fix it. Um, so that's then it just goes to a court of law and it's just basically evidence against evidence. It's not really hearsay about hearsay or I tried to get in or I tried to phone you. It's basically what paperwork do you have to prove that you are doing maintenance on the property? And genuinely, the guy was actually quite a good landlord. He right. was trying to get in and yeah. the tenant wasn't allowing contractors in. But that's a good thing about using 
um, I guess approved contractors is like we log everything, we take pictures of the doors or when we're going there, we keep a log of everything so that mm. if the landlord ever needs it, it's all there. If we've had any failed visits or anything like that. So that that's why it's good to keep a record of all that because if you ever do need it, then you've got that to prove that you did try your best to maintain the property. But he took the decision that he didn't want a, a PAT report done every year. He just wanted it done every every time any ICR was getting done. And does, that, the portable, does the portable appliance test then kind of do exactly what's in the tin? It's a sort of portable appliances. So see if there's appliances that sit for they don't get moved. Integrated. It's what about integrated. integrated. Do they do they stay for do they have to require a longer test or is it still kind of yearly or two yearly as well? So so basically anything that's integrated um should be part of the EICR because it's a fixed a fixed piece of equipment. And there's a wee section on the EICR about fixed equipment. Um so there's a check for that. But then there's a 50-50 case where you can get an, an oven which is fixed in, but mm-hmm. at the back of it is a plug that you plug it in. But it's not portable, so we don't class that. Uh, we mm-hmm. don't put that under a part report. And same with the extractor hood. Usually that's got a plug above it as well. But it's not classed as portable, so it's fixed. It stays there all the time. So what kind of, what kind of things would you can class as the portable appliances then? So portable appliances, if a washing machine that's not integrated, a fridge freezer that's not integrated, and toaster, a microwave, kettle, mm-hmm. they're the kind of five, five things that a landlord uses usually gives a tenant but i'm seeing this year i've seen a massive increase on landlords not giving any appliances to to the tenant that's interesting um maybe that's i mean there was maybe it's a couple of reasons but one of the things that i was thinking is that landlords would then in introduction of the prt which obviously means that tenants can hand in notice within 28 days, 28 days yeah. I, you know maybe the thought of the thought is that if Tenants are having to buy all their own stuff and their appliances. They're more likely to stay longer term, maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, this is obviously your forty. I, yeah. I, I, I think we're seeing a lot more empty houses, even more so from housing associations now that mm. they're not supplying a washing machine, a fridge, freezer. The way I look at it is, m- most I would say sixty or seventy percent of our callouts are for washing machines or fridge, freezers. Like, we get asked to look at them all the time. We don't do that. But what happens is when one of them goes on a blink, it trips the electrics. So right. so basically the landlord's getting a charge for an electrician to go out to reset the electrics to then say you've got a fault with a washing machine or mm-hmm. fridge freezer. Then you've got to send out an appliance engineer. Before you know it, you're two, three, four hundred pound. Where if you hadn't have provided that a piece of equipment, you wouldn't have had that issue or that call out and you you probably able to answer this more like I, I, I'll, maybe you get majority of your calls for issues is like with washing machines not working or mm. st- stuff like that so imagine you just take that out of the equation and it's then up to the, the tenant to provide that it's definitely a huge cost for landlords things like that washing machines one of the number one things boilers obviously that's a necessity yeah, you need yeah. to provide heating in that but uh one thing i would say on that is it is much harder to uh to market and rent a property when it doesn't it's have better. when it doesn't have it, like a fridge freezer and the classes property machine. types next a lot of times when i've rented out probably three bed houses i've never supplied them i've left them completely you know free yeah. white goods whereas the flats I'm doing in Aberdeen and our one bed flats, you've kind of got a young yeah. professional, a young tenant that won't have their own washing and fridge freezer. So Aye. I'm feeling the pinch off to supply the appliances and like Craig saying is maintain them. They're the, yeah. they're the most kind of common thing to go wrong. 100%. If it is for families and, you know, like you said, your three bedroom houses, then chances are, you know, the, 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 uh, house the the tenant is probably going to want a say on what washing machine because of you know yourself guys if you've got if you've got two kids you know and the landlord supplies you with a five kilogram washing machine then you're going to be like this ain't going to this ain't going to cut it you know what i mean so you need the eight the eight kilo and the the dryer and all that to keep on top of the washing if it's a family household yeah absolutely no i know i've got one landlord right who basically cuts a house out like top notch, he's got TVs in the bathroom, he provides TVs, like really nice TVs on the walls, nice table lamps, furniture really nice. And he's asking big, big rent, but they, they seem to be snapped up very, very quickly. Mm. So there's obviously a market 
for all yeah. sorts of different things. And it's when, uh, do you know what I mean? It is, I think we, when it comes to appliances, what you provide for a tenant is really down to where you are, the location, and what, who you're going to bring into the property. But it is probably one of the biggest expenses maintaining fridge, freezers, washing machines, mm-hmm. all that kind of thing. I think over the year, you'll probably get more call outs for that than anything else in the property. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, I think um, that's probably a good place to kind of to finish up. We kind of got off a, off topic a bit, but I like that because obviously uh, people are getting a bit insight there. And you've obviously you're obviously day to day you're experiencing with landlords as well what they're facing as well. So that's good. Um, so I think this probably we've probably got a case to try and get you back on every twelve months or something because it is a kind of fast changing uh, environment. The whole compliance thing. So. Maybe we should make a kind of date or reviewing this every year, but aye. Just, aye, just to kind of sum up, sum up, you know, like where can people uh, get you? Obviously, uh, you provide a solution for all the certifications. So if you just want to mention that, yeah. So basically, we are we can come out. Uh, so we'll send out a team and it would do all your compliance in one visit. This this obviously saves time for the tenant, multiple visits. It saves time for like some Nick who are managing it. it saves time for the landlord gets everything all done in one go, brings all your dates into the one so you can you can kind of keep on top of it. Every year you know that month that you've got your certificates to get done. So yeah, we can come out, we can do your gas safety, your EICR, your Legionella, your PAT, your EPC, install your smokies. You can do it all in one visit. Um, and you can find us basically the usual places, our website, quinergy.co.uk, or our social media. Um, we're on LinkedIn, Facebook, I th- Twitter and Instagram and we we always try to put some kind of funny stories or shock horror things on our social media so that it can show things up and we're trying to showcase some good stuff as well um, Stephen's doing a couple of really good refurbs just now that we're, um, we're hopefully going to try and get, in and get some pictures of that and show how it's done properly and why you get the kind of compliance done first before you're doing your refurb so you can kind of build it all into your, your full investment. So guys, I hope you enjoyed that interview with uh, Craig Gallagher from Quinergy. We certainly did. And you know, the important that you'll have seen that the importance of compliance is so important as a landlord as an investor. Um, so thanks very much for listening. And we would like to read out a quick um, review. So we have a five-star review from Ape Chappie. Great name. This <laughs> is the first property podcast I found that features hosts that don't talk BS. This is an as real as it get as you can get with tremendous value as well. I'm planning on starting my own property investment journey in 2021, and I'm in the process of training myself online and reading books about property. This podcast alone has helped me a lot in my preparation to enter the property market. Their Facebook page is excellent and an excellent source of information with case studies posted regularly. My utmost utmost respect for keeping it real, and I hope Nick and Stephen continue to their high-quality content for a long time. So thank you very much, Appy Chappy, for that five-star review. Awesome, mate. We could definitely do a lot more appy chappies in our lives. So thank you very much for that. I also want to give a shout out to our listeners. If you are on Instagram, then follow myself and Stephen Clark on Instagram. It's Nick underscore Ponte and Stephen Clark Property. Is that right? That's right, Nick. Yep. Good stuff. And if you're listening to the podcast, what to do is take a screenshot of it on your phone and mention us and we will uh, copy that into our stories. And obviously... Hopefully you'll gain a few more followers from that as well. So we're happy to do that. Right, guys. Thank you very much. Until next time. Thanks, guys. Speak to you next time. Bye for now.